Hello, seniors. We are going to be talking about chapter 15 today. Um, chapter 15, like I think probably every chapter in this novel, is one that I think is short and can get through quickly. And then when I start reading it, realize how much Ellison has bitten off and that we'll probably need more time than I was initially prepared to give for it. Either way, we're going to move through it today. Um, I split it up into two parts. Today we are only going to be working up through the narrator leaving Mary's. So we're going to cover the people banging on the pipe because the heat isn't on. Um, the coin bank, the narrator speaking with Mary for the last time that he sees her. And then tomorrow we'll cover the narrator's efforts to try and get rid of the coin bank. So we'll hop right in here. Um, expect some uh, questions to be put up on Google Classroom shortly about these lectures and uh, please do those within a day of them being posted. So for instance, the questions that go with this one will be due tomorrow at 11.59. So I'll begin reading the first quote and I'll kind of annotate as needed as we go through this. My side began itching violently and I tore open my pajamas to scratch and suddenly the pain seemed to leap from my ears to my side and I saw gray marks appearing where the old skin was flaking away beneath my digging nails. And as I watched, I saw thin lines of blood well up in the scratch, was bringing pain and joining time and place again, and I thought, the room has lost its heat on my last day at Mary's, and suddenly I was sick at heart. I think one of the biggest things to notice here, other than this idea that um, a tragedy kind of was compounded by um, the room losing heat on the narrator's last day at Mary's, is this idea of... Um, the narrator scratching himself to the point that he bleeds. He um, saw gray marks appearing where the old skin was flaking away beneath his digging nails. He saw thin lines of blood well up in the scratches. Um, so I think we get that sense that almost like the coal in um, the chapter where he's working at Liberty Paints that was described as being painted white. I think Kimbrough gives that speech. You would never be able to tell what it was underneath. Ellison at first seems to be making this comparison that humanity exists no matter what, that underneath um, the old skin flaking away, you have blood that is red for everyone, in essence, that everyone kind of is the same in terms of pain or the same in terms of biology. But I think it's notable that this is... Um, a very negative scene that the narrator's literally kind of um, harming himself or, or um, you know, uh, disfiguring himself to do this. And it reminds him that he's in a place. Um, before that, he was kind of without understanding where he was. I think another thing we could think of is the hospital where the narrator is um, going through this pain and he's kind of disembodied and then it's this process of feeling enough pain to realize where you are and then kind of waking up in essence becoming human again so we'll skip to the next quote here suddenly i was across the room in a bound pounding the pipe furiously with my shoe heel stop you ignorant fool my head was splitting beside myself i struck pieces of silver from the pipe exposing the black and rusted iron he was using a piece of metal now his blows ringing with a ragged edge if only I knew who it was, I thought, looking for something heavy with which to strike back. If only I knew. So we get another symbol that seems very, very similar to the last quote, um, that he's striking pieces of silver from the pipe, exposing the black and rusted iron. Um, this one, if the last one was kind of optimistic, seems more pessimistic, that there's silver plating on this pipe, and underneath it's just black and rusted iron that... If the last one was scraping away skin, which is kind of old and dying and flaking, and you get to something better underneath, which is blood or humanity, this one's flipped. You have something that looks good on the surface, that's kind of had a veneer or a coating that looks expensive or looks valuable, and then below it or beneath it is um, the black and rusted iron, the thing that's kind of true, but also falling apart and not as valuable. The narrator also, throughout this scene with the people banging on the pipe to um, get the super's attention that the heat is out, um, the narrator gets very angry. And I think we see 
elements of him and his idea of kind of himself versus a community um, coming out. So stop it, you ignorant fool. This idea that the people banging on the pipe are worse than him in some ways are ignorant, in some ways don't care about anybody, in some ways have no sense of community. The narrator says this, but then the narrator also shows, I think, a, a pretty deep level of anger, maybe even hate. If only I knew who it was, I thought. If only I knew. Um, and then he's looking for something heavy to strike the pipe with. It, it seems like there's almost this murderous rage that he felt at Bledsoe after the um, hospital coming back here. And so I think, again, we see the narrator being ironic. On the one hand, he's trying to kind of take the high ground and say, you need to think of others, you need to think of your community. But then in the same breath, he's saying, I'm so angry that I'll kill people if they don't kind of um, get with the program. And so I think um, the narrator's still on that point of being a bit immature or contradictory with how he sees the world. He wants to have it both ways. All right, so next quote here is where we have the coin bank. And the coin bank is one of the most, I think, fascinating images in the whole novel. It's one of those things where you look at it and you go, oh, okay, so it's this kind of um, racist caricature of a black jockey and you put coins into him. Of course, that's something to do about race. But like most of the symbols in here where you feel like Ellison is maybe phoning it in or not trying as hard, there's just layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. that It's easy to get the first one. And in some ways, I think it's easier to get two, three, four, five, six, ten, twenty than it even was the first one. I think that what that's what makes him masterful as an author. So I'll read the quote here. Then near the door, I saw something which I'd never noticed there before, the cast iron figure of a very black, red-lipped and wide-mouthed Negro whose white eyes stared up at me from the floor. His face, an enormous grin, his single large black hand held palm up before his chest. It was a bank, a piece of early Americana, the kind of bank which, if a coin is placed in the hand and a lever pressed upon the back, will raise its arm and flip the coin into it, the grinning mouth. For a second I stopped feeling hate charging within me, then dashed over and grabbed it, suddenly as enraged by the tolerance or lack of discrimination or whatever that allowed Mary to keep such a self-mocking image around as by the knocking. A lot to unpack here, so I'm going to try to take it part by part. First is the question about why the narrator never noticed the coin bank before. It, it seems so odd looking and out of place that it must be noticeable. And I think we have to ask, okay, if he hasn't noticed it previously, what's happening differently in this moment? And it, I think in a lot of ways, it seems to be the anger, the, or even the hate as the narrator describes it, that's charging up within him that um, these images that are offensive are only noticeable in a sense when um, there's tension about. And, you know, whether or not that's what Ellison means, I think that's a possible way to read it. But regardless, we have to ask why the narrator had not noticed this bank in his room until the moment which he's, you know, thrown into a murderous rage by people banging on this pipe to get the heat turned back on. We then move on to Ellison talking about it as a piece of early Americana, almost an antique, almost something that represents our culture. And I think that gets to the kind of contradiction here. One, of course, is, is the kind of horrific stereotype, the very black, red-lipped, and wide-mouthed Negro. But I think there's also the idea of what the bank does. You place a coin in the hand and press a lever on the back, and it will raise its arm and flip the coin into the grinning mouth. When I read this, I was very much reminded of the battle royal scene and the kind of last humiliation that all of the boys are put through, which is grabbing the coin or the coins, the charged coins off of the electrified carpet. And they're shocking themselves as they're grabbing the money. I think Ellison's playing with that idea that um, there is a way where you have to kind of almost objectify yourself or or um, sell your dignity to make money for these groups that are marginalized and that, um, you know, it's only when a lever is pressed upon the back of the coin bank that it does the trick. It flips the coin into the grinning mouth. Um, so it's 
in a way, kind of being forced to enjoy this process. And I, I think, again, that's telling that so much of what the narrator has wanted to do, work at Liberty Paints, work for the Brotherhood, has involved giving up a part of himself or humiliating himself or letting people degrade him when under any other circumstances he wouldn't be doing this were it not for the money. And so I think Ellison's starting to kind of play around with this image here that, again, money and um, a sense of self, usually a negative sense of self, are connected. Finally, the narrator says he's enraged by the tolerance or lack of discrimination or whatever that allowed Mary to keep such a self-mocking image around. He, he seems to be saying, in, a, in essence, at least when I read it, that um, Mary is too tolerant, that there's a limit to tolerance, and tolerating racist images is that limit. And I can't remember if we talked about it in this class or another class, but if you want to look this up, the philosopher's name is Karl Popper. He was, a, I think, a German-American philosopher who wrote a lot about um, science, but also about politics and the idea of the open society. And one of the things he talked about was the paradox of tolerance, that a society can only be tolerant to the ex extent that it blocks intolerant voices, that if intolerant voices are tolerated, they'll kind of drown out the tolerated voices, and in essence, the society will become authoritarian and intolerant. Interesting idea, and I, I wonder um, maybe if Ellison is getting at that, or Ellison would have been familiar with Popper, or at least that idea. But the narrator seems to be saying that, I think, you know, being progressive, being being inclusive, um, being tolerant without kind of being critical at the same time is a negative thing. And again, you know, maybe we could see this as Ellison actually saying that image. Maybe we could see the narrator as an immature person thinking this. But either way, the narrator's attaching these ideas that I think otherwise he would be very much in favor of with bad sorts of things, with being okay with the place and the images and the pain that, that black Americans are put through. So moving on to the next quote here, who started all this? I wondered who's responsible. Why don't you act like responsible people living in the 20th century? I yelled, aiming a blow at the pipe. Get rid of your cotton patch ways. Act civilized. So again, we see the narrator being highly critical, not just in terms of not caring about other people, which is what he said about the people banging on the pipe earlier, stop you ignorant fool. Um, but also, again, this idea that banging on the pipe as a result of being uneducated, being ignorant, maybe even being inferior um, in terms of your identity. So, you know, act like responsible people living in the 20th century. Why don't you kind of come up to speed? Why are you primitive in a sense? And then get rid of your cotton patch ways to act civilized. I think we have to read a lot of what the narrator is saying here is almost parroting a lot of the things that, you know, white people in this book have said about black people and white people in our country's history in the early 20th century have said about black people. This idea that um, being modern, being polite, um, having manners, I think generally quote unquote white manners, is the right way to act and anything else is kind of primitive or inferior or ignorant. The narrator seems to be again switching sides and very eager to trot out this idea that people are um, not familiar with kind of, you know, cosmopolitan, civilized, classy manners and that explains their actions, not their own frustration, not the frustration the narrator himself is actually feeling but the idea that they're more ignorant than the narrator. All right, so we move on here. Just listen to him, just listen to him, Mary called from the hall. Enough noise to wake the dead. They know when the heat don't come up, the super's drunk or done walked off the job looking for his woman or something. Why don't folks act according to what they know? So Mary, like a lot of the places that she's existed in this book, offers a different explanation. It's not that people are uncivilized. It's not that people are ignorant. It's not that they're primitive. It's not that they're uncaring. It's that for whatever the moment is, they've forgotten the context. And that if you keep context in mind that this has happened before, the super's drunk, the super's walked off the job looking for his woman, you can make sense of what's happening around you. Basically, by being a part of a community, you can figure out 
what the good and bad things in your life are. And I think it's interesting that Mary's community is much smaller. The narrator up here is making a community out of being civilized, out of living in the 20th century, these kind of really grand, large statements. To Mary, the community is living in the building, that if you live in the building, you understand what's happening. And if you understand what's happening, you should act according to that knowledge. So I think, again, Mary operates on a more local level. Mary um, operates in a way where she's more connected with the people around her. She's not thinking that every person in the world ought to know this, but she is saying that if you're a part of her community, you ought to understand how it works. And I think that's something that Mary's said since the very first moment that we met her when she seemed so integrated into Harlem and everybody knew her. She took in everybody. She wanted to kind of make the world that she, she saw every day a better place rather than the world that she didn't see every day a better place in a lot of ways. All right, next quote. The figure had gone to pieces like a grenade, scattering jagged fragments of painted iron among the coins. I looked at my hand. A small trickle of blood showed. I wiped it away, thinking, I'll have to hide this mess. I can't take her this and the news that I'm moving at the same time. So, um, again, this idea of blood coming up and that he's destroyed the coin bank and um, he'll have to hide this mess, that his anger that he's taking out is somehow shameful. And so we'll see that in a bit when he puts the, the remnants, the pieces of the coin bank into his briefcase to take it out of there. But his idea that both it's a shameful coin bank, but there's also shame in destroying it is going to run through the rest of this chapter. Where would I hide it, I wondered, looking with profound distaste at the iron kinks, the dull red of a piece of grinning lip. Why, I thought with anguish, would Mary have something like this around anyway, just why? Hell, maybe the thing was left by the former rumor. Anyways, whose ever it was, it had to be hidden. We see the narrator again, I think, blaming Mary the same way he blames Mary for putting expectations on him, the same way he blames Mary for creating a situation where he somehow owes her something. He doesn't blame himself for destroying the coin bank or having the frustration that he does with Mary. He blames Mary. Why would Mary have something like this around anyway? And then he moves on to say, well, maybe it was the former rumor. Anyways, the narrator seems to be kind of trying to absolve himself of guilt, trying to say, well, it wasn't my fault that I smashed the coin bank. That was the right thing to do. Rather, I had smashed it. Um, and if Mary had kept something like this or bought something like this in the first place, none of this would have ever happened. I think, especially with Mary, we see the narrator using this line of reasoning, in essence, that she made him do something he didn't want to do to kind of get around bad feelings that he has about whatever he's doing. All right. Just a few minutes more, you bastards, I said aloud, and I'll be gone. No respect for the individual. Why don't you think about those who might wish to sleep? What if someone is near a nervous breakdown? Again, the narrator angry at the people banging on the pipe, you bastards. Um, no respect for the individual. So the narrator, again, setting up this I versus we community. He's been, I think making it civilized versus uncivilized, but now it's that this community is opposed to him, that an individual's rights are important and a community ought to kind of respect that, that if an individual wants to sleep um, and the community is going through something, the community ought to stay quiet so the individual can sleep. Um, we also, I think, get that sense of the narrator talking earlier about how he's going to do his own thing in the brotherhood, that they have no respect for the individual, he seems to think for a moment. And so he's going to be part of the community as long as it benefits him. But the moment he needs to protect himself, he'll become an individual again. It's odd that I think the people in the apartment banging on the pipe trying to get the heat on are like the brotherhood, but the narrator treats them in the same way, that they both at the end of the day, don't care about him as an individual. And so that justifies for the narrator, you know, hurting them, kind of degrading them. And um, I think kind of like the last quote with Mary makes him feel better about pretty negative emotions and thoughts and feelings he's 
otherwise having about people in his life. All right. And now I realized with a feeling of dread that I had to meet her face to face. There was no way out. Why can't I just tell her that I'm leaving and pay her and go on off? She was a landlady. I was a tenant. No, there was more to it, and I wasn't hard enough, scientific enough, even to tell her that I was leaving. I'll tell her I have a job, anything, but it has to be now. We see the narrator struggling, and um, I think his big struggle here, again, is what Mary represents to him. His first suggestion is, she was a landlady, I was a tenant. This is a business agreement. I think it's ironic that the narrator says he's a tenant and she's his landlady, because up to this moment, it doesn't sound like he's paid her any rent at all. So it's odd that he characterizes the relationship in terms of business terms, not just because she seems to care about him as a human being, not just a source of income, but also because he hasn't been providing income. But then the narrator catches himself and says, no, there was more to it. Um, I think this gets back to that question he asked a couple chapters ago, is Mary my friend? And we still don't have a good answer to that. She seems motherly, she seems friendly, um, she seems helpful, but I wouldn't call her a mother or a friend or um, his only source of help at this moment. The narrator then catches himself and says, I wasn't hard enough scientific enough, which probably jumps out at us from the last chapter as a description that the men in the brotherhood were using, that you ought to set your emotions aside, use science, and this allows you to do the difficult things that otherwise you'd feel bad about doing. Leaving people behind in a communist revolution, um, not paying people the rent when you feel like you've got a bigger task at hand, um, not even having conversations that are going to make you feel bad about yourself and question what you're doing. These are all things that um, the narrator seems to have associated science with at this moment. All right, moving on. Boy, you better start eating again, she warned, pouring me a full cup of coffee. I took the cup and sipped it black. It was bitter. She glanced from me to the sugar bowl and back again, but remained silent and swirled her cup, looking into it. Guess I'll have to get some better filters, she mused. These I get lets through the grounds along with the coffee, the good with the bad. I don't know, though. Even with the best of filters, you have to find a ground or two at the bottom of your cup. Um, it's interesting that the image of coffee has appeared again, because we see that as far back as the diner that the narrator's at when he orders coffee instead of the kind of southern blue plate special, because he sees that as a working man's breakfast. I think, however, we see Mary talking about herself in this kind of classic beat you over the head with a metaphor, Allison way. Guess I'll have to have, guess I'll have to get some better filters. Um, she's talking about coffee filters here, the kind of piece of thin paper you put in between the grounds in your coffee machine in the pot, and then it runs water through, and if you've got a good filter, the only thing that gets through is the water that has kind of the, the taste and the, the essence of the beans in it. If you have bad filters, you get through actually the kind of coffee grounds themselves, and that's not good to drink. But Mary's talking about her own filters, um, how she can tell people are good and bad, or how she can tell things are good or bad. And I think she's wondering that about the narrator to some degree. Um, were you good or were you bad? Were you somebody I should have filtered out or were you somebody right to let through? And I think ultimately we see Mary um, pretty quickly coming to terms with this, that even with the best of filters, you have to find a ground or two at the bottom of your cup, that no matter um, whether you don't let anybody in, you're going to be hurt sometimes, but that's the nature of just going through an experience. If you make coffee and no matter how careful you are, you're going to have some grounds at the bottom of your cup, that's the only way to drink coffee. Just like the only way to meet people, no matter how careful you are, no matter how much you put those people through in terms of kind of checking them out, making sure that they're not going to hurt you or trick you in any way, um, th that's the cost of basically being social, that a few grounds, a few bad people are going to get through, but that's the best you can ever hope to do. So I think a pretty masterful metaphor by Ellison there um, to compare Mary's filter with a coffee filter. It's always one that kind of sneaks up on me and impresses me every time I read it. All right, Oliver's uh, chiming in here if you hear a little meows. 
Where'd you get all that much money? You've been playing the numbers. That's it. My number came up. I said, thankfully, thinking, what will I say if she asks what the number was? I didn't know. I had never played. See there, I know you was a lucky one. Here I've been playing for years, and the first drop of the bucket you hits for that kind of money. I'm so glad for you, son. I really am. But I don't want your money. You wait till you get a job. Um, I think, I, and I'm really happy that I assigned king of the bingo game before we left um, for spring break and now quarantine that I had us read that because so much of this here in just this very small exchange comes up. In king of the bingo game, um, the bingo king had bought those boards the very first time and won and there had been people playing there constantly in the bingo hall. And so he's got this kind of luck, um, at least that everybody else sees him um, saying and they seem to be kind of um, judgmental of that luck in a way jealous of that luck but at the same time it's not the full story and ultimately not good i think we'll see as the book progresses that joining the brotherhood is kind of as bad a thing for the narrator as working at liberty paints as um driving mr norton around all these kind of situations where he felt like he had it in the bag and then was worse off than where he started, him winning the numbers, um, getting this money is not a good thing. The same way the bingo king getting double zero at the end of that story led to him either being, you know, grievously injured or killed by the men who are pulling him off the stage. So Ellison bring up this idea of luck, this idea of who's lucky, who's unlucky, but at the end of the day, luck has nothing to do with it. The game is rigged. So moving on here but that's a hundred dollar bill i take that and try to change it and the white folks will want to know my whole life's history she snorted they want to know where i was born where i work and where i've been for the last six months and when i tell them they still gonna think i stole it ain't you got nothing smaller so mary realizing kind of the realities of her place in harlem and now the narrator's place working with the brotherhood he says that's the smallest i have but mary realizes the reality that is you know, this woman who's lived in Harlem, this woman who makes her money, um, if she makes any at all, by renting out her home to the different kind of down on their luck cases in Harlem, she's never going to be able to kind of jump into that level of society where she won't be questioned if she has a hundred dollar bill. That she's always going to have to struggle with, where will I spend this? Who will treat me credibly if I have this? The narrator in a lot of senses seems to think that he's already part of the group that won't get questioned. And so I think we see again, um, Mary kind of uh, being a bit more authentic. Mary saying, I'm in Harlem for the long run and I'm aware of what that means and the narrator um, not being that case. In the same way the narrator wasn't aware of what the people banging on the pipe meant, Mary instantly said, look, we've been here for a long time. This is how it works. Once you understand it, you need to learn some way to deal with it. All right, next quote. I'm really glad because now I can take care of that bill that they've been bothering me about. It'll do me so much good to go in there and plop down some money and tell them folks to quit bothering me. Son, I believe your luck doesn't change. You dreamed that number. I glanced at her, your fa her eager face. Yes, I said, but it was a mixed up dream. So we have the instance here of Mary saying that she does have bills and she's happy that she got paid because now she can finally pay those bills off. Uh, I think in some ways it's the narrator's worst nightmare that he has been leeching off of Mary and Mary had her own troubles and finally she can take care of them. But I think it speaks to Mary that Mary hasn't confirmed this to the narrator that she's had bills she's been worried about until she's been in a place to be able to pay him. Put another way, she didn't want to add anything to the narrator's plate. And so I think she's selfless in that way that she kept up the pretense of everything being all right so that the narrator could take care of his problems when in fact she had her own. Finally, this that he dreamed the number, yes, I said, but it was a mixed up dream. Um, dreams have been important here. Uh, an important one is, of course, the dream in chapter one that he has with his grandfather. and. Um, whether or not this is where he dreamed the number, I guess we could play with. He does open letter after letter after letter there, but the narrator saying it's a mixed up dream. It's not good. It's not bad. 
it's one I can't even make sense of, which seems to be so much of the world at this point. And probably even his job with the Brotherhood. The job with the Brotherhood will turn out to be will turn out to be a mixed up dream, neither good nor bad, nor even fully understandable. All right. Second to last quote, here's some folks just live in filth, she said disgustedly. Just let a little bit of knocking start, and here it comes crawling out. All you have to do is shake things up a bit. So I think Mary's talking again about the narrator, that some folks just lived in filth. Not necessarily physical filth, but filth in terms of their anger and their dislike for others. Just let a little knocking start, and here it comes crawling out. I think she's talking about the roaches, but she's also talking about the anger that the narrator had for everybody around him, that as much as he says he's there to help the community, as much as he says he cares about the black experience, all it takes is for another black person to get on his nerves and he's ready to murder them over what he sees them as doing wrong. All you have to do is shake things up a bit. All it takes to see kind of who's actually for a cause and who's for a cause because it gives them some advantage is to make life a little more difficult and then very quickly things fall out in terms of who's dedicated to a cause and who's dedicated to helping themselves and sees the cause as a way to do that. Last quote here, putting on my overcoat, I got down my prized briefcase from the closet. It was still as new as the night of the battle royal and sagged now as I placed the smash bank and coins inside and left the flap. Then I closed the closet door and left. Um, we'll see the briefcase come up really prominently over the next few chapters, but the narrator's putting the coin bank inside of it. And so keeping in mind what's in the briefcase, um, his scholarship letter, he has the coin bank, and it seems like he's kind of assembling the different things from his past that are important to him. So we'll see that Mary is important to his life and whether he realizes it or not at this moment, he's going to be literally carrying parts of that time at Mary's with him the rest of the book. But he also notes that the briefcase was as new as the night of the battle royal. I think we also take that to mean the narrator's matured very little since that time. That if the briefcase represents this maturing that he was supposed to get from the college experience that he got the scholarship for, that not much has happened. And if you remember back to chapter one, the men who give him the briefcase say that he's going to fill it with important letters that will carry the fate of his people. I think in a very kind of ironic, twisted way that started happening with the coin bank and the coins, that this in a sense is the fate of his people um, according to the men at the Battle Royal. So we'll stop there. Tomorrow we will pick up with um, the narrator trying to get rid of the coin bank, which is its own kind of odd fever dream. Um, people constantly kind of calling him out for trying to leave it in different places. But I'll be posting questions for this shortly, and then we'll wrap up 15 hopefully tomorrow, and then by Wednesday have a reading response for 15 do at the end of the day. I'm not going to create alternate prompts. I appreciate the effort people put into choosing one or the other and working with that. But frankly, I think um, it caused a bit of confusion that was unnecessary. And I'd like to move back to just talking about the book, at least for a while, now that I feel like you and I have our sea legs um, in this online learning environment. So I hope everyone's doing well, um, staying healthy, and I will talk